Hi, so my name's Manuel Klimek. Uh, I work at Google and I want to uh, give a tutorial on Clang's AST today. Why am I doing that? Um, something I care a lot about is that I want C++ to actually arrive in the 21st century. Um, and part of that is that we need really good tools, right? A lot of other languages are way ahead in terms of tooling. And now we have Clang and we have a lot of great infrastructure to build tools on, but the problem is to build those tools, you need a working knowledge of the Clang AST. Uh, so I really want to write those tools. I cannot write all of those tools myself, so I need you to help me write those tools. So I will just put the Clang AST in your face and hope that afterwards you have enough knowledge of the Clang AST that you will think like, oh, I should write a tool. Um, so when I talk about working knowledge about the Clang AST, uh, what I'm talking about is you need to know the basic structure, the kind of classes that are there, how you can navigate them, and tools that help you learn uh, more about the Clang AST. I've been working with the Clang AST for probably two and a half years now, and I still learn something new every day. So the most important part is to learn how to actually figure out what's happening. Um, short raise of hands, how many of you do not think they have a working knowledge of the Clang AST? Okay, that's enough people uh, so that I, that talk actually makes sense. Hmm? <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so let's talk about the very basic things first. What, what makes Clang's AST special? Uh, it's a very rich AST representation compared to what you have in other languages. You have a very accurate representation uh, of the source locations for every node in the AST. Um, it is also fully type resolved, which is kind of comes from C++. Uh, you cannot parse C++ without doing the type resolution, so you don't have a fast way to get a non-type resolved AST. And it's also huge. Right? It's more than 100,000 lines of C++ code, and that's just the AST. That is not like the semantic analysis or anything. It's just like the classes in the AST. So let's look at those classes in the AST. And the first thing you'll notice when you look at Clang's AST is that it's highly optimized for like size and speed, and especially size, right? In C++, you all of us have those huge transitive inclusion, and you have ASTs for all of them, so your nodes need to actually be small. Uh, so the first class you always encounter when handling the Clang AST is what's called the AST context. Um, a lot of the nodes in the AST just keep small identifiers that point into stuff in the AST context, right? Like identifiers are not stored with every node, they are stored in an identifier table and the nodes just point in there. The same is for locations, we will see the location stuff in much more detail later. Um, and the other thing the AST context provides is the entry point into the AST, which is a function called tr get translation unit decal that gives you the translation unit decal and with that we basically go into the the core classes of Clang's AST, right? Those are declarations, statements, and types. Um, those are the classes that have identity in the Clang AST and they also have pointer identity, which means if you have two of them, you can compare their pointers to figure out whether they are equal. Um, so let's look at some examples of what those classes might be, right? For each of those, classes is the base of a whole hierarchy uh, of classes, right? There are lots of different kinds of declarations and they are all inherited from decal. There are lots of different kinds of statements. They are all inherited from statement. Uh, the interesting part is, as compared to other ASTs, there is no common base class, right? Which also means there is no common way to, um, to visit all those, right? But we will go into that in a moment. So first, let's take a look at some examples. Seek 6 record title, which is one of the core things if you handle C++ uh, that we, you will encounter. Now, why is it called Seek 6 record decal and not class decal or something, right? And that's where I start teaching you tutorial style. The first thing you need to learn is whenever you encounter a class in Clang's AST, you ha we have this great online Doxygen documentation. You just go to your favorite search engine and you insert clang and seek six record decal and there the first link usually is exactly the documentation for that. 
right? And then you can find all the members and at some point you will also find sometimes a short uh, explanation of what this is. So yes, this represents structs, unions and classes. That's why it's called a record decal. Right, but there are also other declarations, variable declarations, and one reason why the Clang's AST is so big because C++ is so complicated, right? You have stuff like an unresolved using type name declaration. Yeah, great. Um, then statements. Let's look at some common type of statements. The compound statement, the most basic statement you can get. You have things like a CXX try statement and you have a binary operator. Binary operator is an expression. In Clang's AST, expressions are statements. And uh, if you ask Doug Gregor on IIC, you will kind of, even, even though it's purely text-based, you will basically see him go, oh, yeah, I was young and I thought that was a good idea to like save some bytes in the AST. And uh, he would also like, if, if we could fix that, if anybody of you has the time to put in to fix that, that would be great. Um, one of the interesting parts that we will see later is that this makes it really hard. We don't have a place to store the semicolon, like where we reference the semicolon from. And if you do source to source transformations, like some people do, um, that's a problem, right? And then we have types, right? Types in C++ are also complex. There are many different types. Types can be uh, nested, like a pointer type. Uh, there are parent types, and there are strange things like sub-template type param types, right? Again, the Clang AST is huge because of C++. Speaking of types, no, uh, first, yeah, let's, uh, we have, um, so we have those basic three classes that have identity, but when you work with the Clang AST, you will find a lot of different other classes. Um, and those classes are what I call glue classes. Um, they are basically there to, uh, to get you from one place in the, in the AST to another one. For example, decal context is something that some of the declarations uh, inherit from if they can contain other declarations, right? Uh, template arguments can be different types of nodes. Nested name specifiers model certain kinds of a declaration or something, right? And call types we, see, we will see uh, in more detail in a moment when we look into types. Um, and then, now we have all those classes, but as I said before, there's no common interface to all those classes. So how do you actually traverse the AST? And that's what I call glue methods, or you can call them traversal methods or something. So every node, every special node uh, of a certain type has methods that give the nodes it connects, right? It's easiest if you look at a example, if you look at an if statement, right? An if statement clearly has a then statement, an else statement, and you traverse that by actually calling that uh, method on the if statement. Um, but Clang's AST is not only a tree, right? It's actually a graph because you can jump from parts of the AST to other parts. As with uh, a C6 record decal, you can get the described class template. We'll go some more into templates later, but not into too much detail because that would be a whole talk on its own. Um, and interesting things like for, for if you have a type and that type is a like C6 record type or a class type, then you can get to the uh, declaration of that class from the type, right? Um, so now we get to types. Types are complicated. Why are types complicated? Uh, in C++, right, you have very simple examples like you have an int x and a const int x and basically the int is the same underlying type and you have qualifiers on the type um, and if you want to store all those different combinations of time types you basically get an ex explosion of combinations so you want to don't want to do that so how clang models this is it has a qual type which contains the qualifier to the type and that points to its type it sounds pretty simple when we get into more complex examples that's not as simple anymore Right, because you can have nested types. Um, so if you have something like this, right, the qualifier can be in the middle of that type. So if you look at a pointer type and how you traverse, like how you get to the type it points to, 
right? You get a qual type out. Um, and if you, so if we look at that for a simple example, like an int pointer, um, the int pointer basically is a qual type, which points to its type, which is a pointer type. And then you can traverse from that to the built-in type by going over the inner qual type. So enough of types, let's talk about location. Locations are also very interesting. Uh, locations are really, really clever. They are kind of genius, but mad genius. Um, so uh, at first glance, locations are pretty simple, right? There's locations are just an ID, and uh, the, the real information behind those loca locations are stored in the source manager because like there are so many locations all over uh, the AST, you don't always want to f store the full like line column stuff. They are very cleverly uh, um, encoded in this ID, so you have common operations very fast, and you always point to tokens because right you have Alexa, so you can if you point to tokens, you can always get the information about the length of a token later. Um, so let's look at how you get to locations for the common uh, core classes we have. So start, let's start with a declaration. Declarations are actually pretty simple and have some very common ways on how you deal with them. Right? The first thing you notice is that they usually have a get lock start and get lock end, which points to the first token and the last token respectively. Right? In this case, the closing brace is the last token. Um, if that was longer, right, it, it would actually po point to the first, to the start of that token. Um, then declarations have a method called get position that give you the position of the identifier that of the thing that is declared here. And because this is a, a method declaration, you can get a qualifier location, which will give you the first, and which will give you a range actually, which is the f from the first to the last token uh, of that qualifier. Um, now let's look at statements. Statements are much more interesting because they can like have many, many different, uh, they can look many, many different ways. First, they have a start and end location too, but now for everything else, we have a very simple uh, method call here, right? And for, for everything we want to get at, we actually need to drill through what is actually there, right? We have a method call here and that has a callee, right? And uh, that callee has a, you can get the base expression, which can be any expression. In this case, I have a variable, so it is a declaration reference expression. And the declaration reference expression has a name info in it, which I can get out. And from that, I can get the location, and then I'm finally in the location of that, at the location of that identifier. And to get the location of the right part here, right, I again, the callee is a member expression in this case, and because it's a member expression, it has a member name info, and I can get the location of that. Uh, this is simplified, right? If you want to do that on an AST, you actually have to put dynamic casts in here everywhere, because, right, you're not sure that this is actually uh, a member expression if you if you just see a a, um, a function call right the interesting part is if this if this here uh, was a static call it would be completely different to do all that like if this is a static function even though I address this via a variable I have a completely different representation representation of that in the AST all right Let's look at my uh, at types again, right? Uh, types are usually complicated with locations. Uh, They're actually not that complicated because um, the interesting part about types is that the location is decoupled from the type because I can reference a type in many uh, places in my program. Here, for example, uh, right? I have a declaration, my class in that the, the type, right? I have it as a variable declaration, as a parameter declaration. And uh, Clang models the location of types as type lock, right? So I have two different type locks that all point to the same type. Um, and again, when you have a type lock, 
you have the well-known get log start and get log end that give you the first and the last token of the type uh, in that case, right? Doesn't point to qualifiers. I actually have uh, no idea how to get the, the equation of the qualifiers, but I have never needed that. Um, now, if we put all that together, what we just learned for types, we get an interesting picture, right? This is just for, for this simple pointer declaration. The interesting part is that the type blocks form a shadow hierarchy to the types. And then we have, well, the types, we know already that they're all, there's always a qual type around them. So the whole thing looks like that, right? You can, if you have a pointer type block, you can get to the inner like the type lock it points to by saying get pointy lock and uh, but from the type lock you can also get to the type through the qual type right and then you can get to its inner type again through the qual type <coughs> so enough about types um, as some people have mentioned on this conference before there's a lot of interest in doing source to source translations um, and it is actually possible. One of the interesting things you, you have to be careful about is when you want to do source to source translation, what we support and uh, what works very well for us is you just get the text for something and then you do a textual modification. The interesting part is when you try to get the text for, for some part of C++, there are macros involved. I, I won't go into the details of macros and source location handling there because it would take another half hour and it's like, it's really, really crazy. Um, but Clang provides, in the Lexa, it provides some abstractions that are intended to do the right thing. Right? For example, there's the make file char range and you give it a range of source code and it tries to figure out through macros and all that stuff what text you actually mean. Uh, there are some bugs in that that we are currently working on fixing, but it already works for the like 99% case actually. Um, and then, as you've learned before, right, the source locations always point at tokens. So if you want the relocation of something, you have to measure the token length, and that's also you need the lexa for that. There are also other ways to get the text. And everybody seems to run into the same problems there because uh, you can get the text right from the source manager uh, without uh, doing any of the cool stuff that make file char range does and you will just run into problems. Um, then one other interesting thing about the Clang AST is uh, how templates are handled. I will not go into, uh, into that into too much detail, um, but there are a few interesting things that uh, very just different from other compilers, right? Uh, the first thing is that the full AST of the template definition is available. So it's modeled as a C6 record decal that has dependent types inserted everywhere where the type is not currently known. And the interesting part is that, especially if you do source to source transformations, you can already do some source to source transformations on that template definition without needing an instantiation for it. Of course, all instantiations are also available. So for, that's really Im important if you want to index code and you want to find where things are called for, uh, from. It's easy to find all places in all instantiations where, th where some other function is called from. Uh, one interesting pitfall to look out for, and one of the reasons why I'm not convinced that rewriting the AST itself and then doing something with it is a good idea, is, for example, that AST nodes can be shared between template instantiations, right? So a node can actually have multiple parents, and there are lots of corner cases around that. So in the beginning, we've seen there is no common interface to traverse the AST uh, in by having a common base class but uh, you need to know all the methods you need to call. Uh, and to help with that, because we don't want everybody to have to write out all those uh, dynamic casts all the time, um, there's the recursive AST visitor, which is basically a macro monster 
putting together all this knowledge about how you traverse each and every node in the AST. Uh, the interesting thing about that is you trigger on certain types you care about. So you can say, let me visit all statements, and then it, it will call you back for all statements. Um, <coughs> the, it does not give you context information around the parents or children, though, right? You, can, you get a, a specified order, but you have to do all the contextual putting it together yourself. And to help with that, there are AST matchers, um, which again, I won't go into, into too much detail. I will show you examples later. Um, but for now, the important part is that they, they make the contextual stuff easier. So they allow you to trigger on expressions of context. And then you get a callback whenever that context is met. Right? But now let's go into something that's much, much more uh, important. And that's the tools that help you understand the AST yourself when you run into problems. Um, and with that, we go into the code. I hope that will be all readable. So first, uh, Clang itself uh, can do AST dumps. So I have a very simple C++ file. It doesn't have any dependencies. Uh, so I can just say dash, dash x clang dash ast dump uh, dash f oops, syntax only cannot type usually. Oh, I just leave that away. And uh, minus the linker warning in the end, this will give me a dump of the ast. Um, we can also, we also have uh, Clang Check, which has an integration with a tooling framework we've built, which helps you to dump the AST for projects, for files in projects that are larger, where right here, if I had some includes that are not standard includes, I would need to write out all the include paths. Um, so let's look into an example. Let's look into some table gen file in LVM, right? Uh, what we see here, for example, what might look interesting in the AST, they're returning something with lots of like concatenation of strings and we actually have no idea what's going on there. So for that, we can call clank check and we just give it the pass. Uh, and first, we, we don't actually know how exactly those things are called. I just remembered add value or something. So we can do AST list, right, which will give us the whole list and we can just grab for, for stuff that's in there, right? You see, uh huh, there's TG parser add value. So let's dump that. And yes, let's pipe that into less, uh, yes, less dash r. Yes, so um, that's the AST dump of that whole function. And if you just look at the return statement, right, uh, that's a little big. So we will not get into the detail of this, but this is how you can drill down into what's actually happening in the AST in some random piece of code, right? You use clank check, you use AST dump, you use AST dump filter. Uh, for now, we will just look at a very uh, simple example. Uh, I've prepared the code here, right? Um, we have some code that takes a constant string reference and we have some call, code that calls it and you might notice that there is a call to cstrue in here, right? It's a string and it calls cstrue on a method that takes a standard string reference. Uh, those things ap actually happen um, in reality because this function might have originally been taking a const char pointer and somebody thought, hey, 
we have 2010, perhaps that's not the greatest idea. Let's change that to take a constant string reference. Obviously this code doesn't break, so nobody notices, nobody changes it. We waste CPU. Um, so you might want to actually find those cases in the code, and that's where Clang can help you. So we can look at how that, uh, how that looks. Right, again, it's pretty huge. The interesting part is that the lower part here is all uh, the ST dump of the actual CPP file. And now I have prepared some slides to actually guide you through how to read such an AST dump, right? Because at first it looks pretty, it just, uh, just hits you over the head, right? Um, so let's look from, from the inside out what is there, right? First, we have the call to dot C stru in the, in the innermost uh, call, right? And that's a C66 member call expression, right? And the dot C stru is a member expression um, and it's on the variable S, which is a declaration reference, declarative expert. Then around that, um, and that's why the ASTs are so huge in C++, there's all this implicit stuff going on, right? In this case, there's an implicit construction of a string because the function that we're calling actually takes a, a string reference. So now there's a, the materialized temporary expression, a bind temporary expression, and in that is the construct expression. One thing that's uh, often not intuitive to people coming new to that AST, uh, a construct expression is an implicit construct. We will see the, how the explicit construct looks in a moment. And that actually takes two parameters, right? And the one parameter is the const char pointer uh, from the call to C through, and the other one is the allocator. And around that, um, we have the call to F, which is then the call expression, right? And again, you find the declarative expert to the actual function being referenced. And now one interesting thing to look at is what if we do a very simple change to this code and explicitly write the conversion to standard string in here? Right, um, and now let's look at how the AST changes. We got two new nodes, and we got this, which is the C6 functional cast expression, which models the explicit writing of that standard string functional cast. Uh, so that's basically the way you figure out how, when you read the AST dump, what happens. Now we go into Another example, and that's basically, that's a playground when you want to learn about the ASD. Um, that's a unit test actually, that's pretty much the smallest unit test I can write for, for the ASD. Uh, it uses the ASD measures, the details are not really important, right? This is some setup. Here we initialize a ASD matcher that matches record decals and we bind that to the ID X um, and then more setup and we actually run it over this code here, struct X. And then we get a callback and in the callback we extract the thing we bound and then we dump it, right? Clang's AST node often have a method called dump or something similar. Sometimes they need a source manager or something, but in general um, that's how you can debug the AST. So let's run that. And now you see what matched. Uh, the people in here very familiar with the intricate details of C++ will immediately know what's going on. When I saw that the first time I was like, what? Why does it match two times? And then Chandler was so nice to explain to me that uh, there is an injected class name, which is called x colon colon x. So first we, we visit the class definition, right? And that class definition has the injected class name, that's why we have that uh, b both here. And then we again visit the injected class name because it also is a CX6 record tag. So 
We don't want to see that, so we can change the code to just, for example, say, say has name colon colon x. Right, we only want to see record decals that have the name colon colon x. We recompile, we rerun the test, and now we only see the outer one. Now we can play around some more with that. Uh, let's say we make that a template uh, x and let's do an instantiation of that. Let's compile actually. Looks like. And now we see how template, wh what you get when you have a template instantiation. Um, Again, first you get the six eight record tackle, that's the definition, like the, the template uh, definition, and then you get a class template specialization tackle, which all the types resol uh, resolved and some implicit stuff uh, going on here. And uh, then we can, for example, look at, like I told you earlier, you can get locations out of this stuff. How do those locations look, right? We have uh, source location, uh, or we just dump them. So we just, we have our, uh, Can you turn that off? No, I, no, I mean, um, not now, I mean in general. What? The pop down. Yes, I like the pop down. No, I need, I need to turn that off. Uh, hmm? But it has to be turned on. It's Vim. It's Vim, yes. <laughs> what can you not turn off in Vim? But I kind of like uh, semantic code completion. I'm, I'm, I don't have memory, so. Uh, That worked. And uh, now we, for example, dump the source location. Unfortunately, I didn't enter uh, a new line, so it's kind of mixed in. But you can see like now on line, in our example, in line 123, right? That's somewhere here. You get that hit to the uh, declaration. Yeah, and uh, with that, I'm at the end of my tutorial. There are um, actually many links to documentation while documentation is still sparse. Uh, if you run into any problems, we are always very happy to get patches to the documentation. Um, and yeah, with that, we're open to questions or if you have want to see stuff that we can figure out or not how it works in the AST, you can also just throw out ideas of what we could do here. I have questions about uh, AST for invalid code. For example, from what I've seen, if we are referencing a function that is in a header that was not found, for example, or something like that, the whole expression is removed from the AST. Is there any way to get a, a more basic AST with no, uh, where functions call are not solved but are not removed? <coughs> I don't think so. But I'm also, I, ha I don't know, but uh, like, Perhaps Chandler or Richard can answer that question. Richard can. The answer is no. Wait, 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 wait. Mike. <laughs> so the answer is no. We don't support building ASTs which don't obey our AST invariants. Um, so whenever we build an expression, we want to make sure that it's actually valid. Otherwise, downstream parts of the compiler are going to have a lot of trouble with it. I think it, uh, an interesting question would be what you need it for, right? Because for code completion, Clang has its own 
uh, mechanism, right? It inserts basically a code completion token and then tries to fall back, like do do uh, um, re, what's it called? <coughs> like recovery, yes, for the at that point, and then so that's how it does code completion. And uh, if you want to, for example, form an invalid code, right? If you were uh, in in Daniel's um, talk. We actually have a parser for that, but it's not Clang's. It, it parses something that looks like C++. Right, so the question is, what do you want it for? Uh, got a question regarding this recursive AST visitor. So um, the problem I had with this visitor is that that's this is huge macro monster. Yes. And uh, when something explodes, it's almost impossible to debug because you have all these macros and you have no clue on what's going on. Have you some advice about debugging? Well, there are two ways. There's w one is we have built the AST matches for a reason, uh, right? And we are currently in the process, like a colleague of mine is uh, um, contributing uh, a way to dynamically construct those AST measures so you can play around with them much more easily. And I think that will, like, that's a good way uh, to actually see where you're trying to get. Um, if you really want to work with the recursive AST visitor directly for some reason, uh, well, throw, like, put on a debugger and, yeah, hope, hope that somebody implements macro support in the debugger. <laughs> no, uh, do you have an answer? Chandler was there when this macro monster was introduced, so I couldn't yeah, fight it. I, I, I'm sorry about the macro mon monstrosity. I actually argued against it when it was being implemented, and, and I was shouted down from many points. Uh, so, so my first question, of course, is are you, are you trying to debug at compile time or at run time? Most people have trouble debugging the AST, uh, the workers AST visitor at uh, compile time more than at run time. And, and the compile time errors, I think the best technique is to use Clang to, to compile. And it actually produces pretty readable error messages, even for the recursive AST visitor. And if you don't think the error message you get from your compiler is reasonable, you should file a bug about that, because we, we actually like to fix those. If your bug is, is at runtime, um, I've actually never really had a problem stepping through the, the runtime behavior of the recursive AST visitor. But I, I think you know Eric and others would also appreciate bugs there to have better debug info. And yeah, print. You can, you can change that. What I actually uh, did by writing the AST matrix is just changing the Curse AST visitor to put in step-by-step -step output of what it's doing. But it's complex, yes. Uh, th that comes with, th that's basically the pi price you pay for not having that common interface, right? Um, so, is there a way when you want to search for a certain pattern, I don't know, when you want to switch on um, a variable of a certain type, that you can, uh, well, search for the variable and then find back to parent to see if it is a switch. So, um, yes. <laughs> you want me to type that out? Uh, we can also, uh, like, you can just write write an email through the list and we can answer that there in more detail and like iterate on what you actually want to do. Uh, but in principle, uh, that's all there. It's not like it landed like a few months back, so it's pretty new that we have a, a parent map in the AST context that actually allows efficiently uh, to, to do matches on the context. And we also have in the, um, the AST measures have a method where in the callback, like up here, I can just call match on the node I have, and I have a has parent, for example, where I can say has parent switch statement, right? And that works. Uh, but the, the problem with that is always in the details, what implicit things can be in there, right? That's the hard part. Um, I had a problem with the AST matches uh, recently. I wanted to use true transform uh, in the callback, 
but um, three, the, the callback has on, uh, uses a, an AST consumer and it's not a SEMA consumer and the class is not mutable. You cannot modify, subclass it. Um, so, uh, what did you try to do? Well, to, to modify the nodes uh, to do source, source, source transformations. Yes, so my, my, uh, <laughs> my, my advice is don't do that. Uh, so we do, <laughs> we do source to source transformations um, by uh, having, by producing, in, in the ca uh, callback, we produce um, replacements, right? see whether we find that. Um, so the idea is that you generate a list of replacements which basically, and, and those you can construct when you're in the callback. Um, and we, we actually have also some infrastructure to apply them in the end because uh, one interesting part about that is that you have to deduplicate them because when you visit headers, right, you have, you, you may do the same or actually you may try to do multiple conflicting edits at the same time, right? Let's say you, you, you do something on templates, right? So you, you might want to edit a template uh, definition in different ways that doesn't work. So we actually need to go through all the places where things are happening, collect all the different edits you're trying to make, deduplicate them or go back to the user and say, no, you cannot do that and then apply them, right? And uh, that is our uh, recommended way to do that. And that works, we, we are doing that for two and a half years on 100 million lines of code. So it definitely works. Uh, it's not as much targeted to, if you, if you don't actually want to write out that source code, right? If you just want to do, and I don't really call that source to source transformation, if more of what you want to do is, you want to change the AST to just use the backend magic to produce code, um, which is a very different use case, I think. Um, Chandler has an opinion. This is not my own opinion. I'm proxying Doug Gregor because he's not here. But uh, uh, some time ago, when we first contributed the AST matcher infrastructure to Clang, one of the hopes was that we could actually use uh, fine-grained AST matchers and the callbacks within them to um, analyze the ASTs that we are in the process of building. There's, there's a lot of spaghetti code inside of the semantic analysis of Clang that we could potentially simplify by using uh, library abstractions like AST matchers. However, um, it turns out that in all of those cases, we're, we're actually pretty much okay not having a mutable AST because the region of the AST that we want to analyze is not the region we're trying to mutate. And, and in fact, it almost needs to not be the region we're trying to mutate because otherwise we have a very challenging problem. If we insert a new class into the AST and, and that's a valid match for the matcher we are running, do we match that or not? Which way you answer that, I mean, either, either answer is possible, but which way you answer that changes the efficiency and the strategy of the implementation. And, and it's much more clear that we are not going to match any new things you put into it if the AST piece that you're walking over is in fact const, is, is immutable. So that was, that was some of the original design ideas. And what I suspect is that we still are missing some API changes necessary to enable that particular use case. And I do think that's a valid use case and we should yes. make sure we support it. No, we don't it. miss that. So uh, what I wanted to follow up with, you, we actually allow you to shoot yourself in the foot there. Um, so you can now, not using uh, the, the match finders, like running, like getting the, the, um, the front end action out of it, but just uh, you can, it has now methods, so you can just run it on an AST node. And you can do that anywhere where you have an AST node. And that is also, you can put that in wherever you have AST nodes with SEMA available and you can do the matches. And then you can bind like, because you have this callback, you can bind something to your callback that lets you modify the AST. So that works now. Some more questions? Thank you, Manuel.